Hello, everyone, and welcome to Learning Space number 99. It's kind of hard to imagine that we've been doing this for that long. Um, we're going to be doing on July 29th our 100th episode and looking back on our favorite moments from the past and looking forward to all the awesome things we're going to do post International Astronomical Union meeting in August. Um, so much science this summer. Uh, the the highlight of the summer for many of us was on getting to series no that wasn't it um <laughs> although i am wearing my series shirt because series uh series is the other former planet and currently covered in dog hair didn't know that till i got close to the camera um so uh no yesterday on july 14th the new horizon spacecraft after over nine years of flight finally reached uh its first kuiper belt object of what we hope will be multiple and this was the first time that any space agency in the world has managed to go and explore a kuiper belt object and this was the last object in our solar system that has been called a planet in a big way um, to get visited. Ceres is the other object that's been called a planet. A few others have too, we don't talk about them. Um, but this is huge. And while I was trapped at home writing a grant, uh, my co-host, guest co-host for today, um, while George is off uh, sciencing in East St. Louis uh, is Alice from Alice's Astro Info and she was running amazing workshops in the Seattle area. Can you tell everyone what you were up to while we were waiting to find out if the spacecraft was okay? Well we had a great time. I was uh, over at the High Point Branch Library here which is one of the Seattle Public Libraries and um, we had a couple of activities going to like pass the time while we were waiting. The first stuff was uh, Pluto Globe and this is a brand new one, so I'll, I'll show you the, the full-on thing. Um, that's just so you can cut it out and make it yourself. But uh, you can fold it into an actual full-on globe. You can download one from NASA right now, um, and it uses the Hubble data. Um, this isn't the one that you download from NASA. This is a test case that we were doing to figure out what the best folding was, and icosahedrons are the best. D20s. E20s are the best. Um, so it was. it's all with the Hubble data because there isn't a, a new official NASA map yet. Um, so thanks to Bjorn Janssen, uh, he's been putting together unofficial maps over on unmanned space flight. And we pulled those down. And um, my dad processed them in Flexify on Photoshop, which turned them out into a polyhedron that you can then fold and put together. So I had that going. Um, and we also, uh, on the same page, we have a to scale Sharon. So we're waiting for that map of Sharon. Bjorn, are you listening? Come on. Where's that map of Sharon? I, I think that it's actually, new picture. I, I think I actually saw it fly by uh, in the Twitter feed. So I think he's already okay. done it. Good, good, good. OK, so you know, maybe tonight. Or you know, it might take us a few days now that, like, the sleep. encounter has happened, yes, yeah, sleep. Um, but these are to scale with each other, which is very exciting. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, but yeah, these are the latest. You can't get later than this, later than unofficial. <laughs> Do you want, want to see the other ones, Pamela? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, just keep going. OK, uh, let me show you a picture, because this was the one that we had up as an activity. And you can get that down on my website. I'm sure we'll post links somewhere, and I will make sure. We're going to do full that. show notes. There will be a blog post on cosmicness.org slash x slash educator zone. And if you're one of our Patreon sponsors, yeah. uh, we're going to throw everything up on Patreon. So Great. This is okay, so yes, these are just the links. I just wanted to make sure I, I put those up, because that way anybody who's watching it in video can pause. Uh, and look at them. But then what I really want to show you is that we were able to use, well, my dad was able to use, um, and he's awesome, Flexify to make some really, really cool ones. Where did I put them? We are all running on so little sleep at this point. So, so <laughs> to, give you, to give you an idea of, of what's been going on, uh, I'm not even there. So I have a lot of sleep compared to the folks there. 
Um, I was up yesterday at six in the morning to see the image come down. All day yesterday was spent explaining science on Twitter. Then we got more images last night. Then there was the cheerful celebrating. And then NASA had a grant due today. So I was writing a grant and other people Why were- Why would NASA do that to you? So, so you were doing these things with the public all yeah. day yesterday. Wow, yes. what, that is not, so, uh, not a D20. No, no, this is many more. It's um, it, it's <laughs> geodesic, so it's it's all triangles, but they're slightly different shapes. The one on the far right uh, is the old Hubble data Pluto, and then the, the two next to it are both the most recent Pluto. Um, well, not most recent at this point, because we've got that little bit more de detail on the heart on Tombach Regio. Um, but these, those are both the most recent ones. We made sure I had a backup just in case kids squashed one of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that was exciting. Um, and uh, so we made, my dad put those together. It's, they're wonderful, they're amazing, they're really great. I'm a fan of having things you can put your hands on. I'm a major fan of that. And photos are wonderful and they are a big step up for the general public beyond data, because data takes a lot of work to make it exciting for the general public, as you know. It can be done, but it's harder. And then just the more tactile you can make it, and we have whole make globes. And and what's awesome about this is is you don't get lost in uh, scale issues that you get when you try and print things flat. We we've all at some yeah. point had that epiphany that Africa is really by far the largest landmass on Earth, but there are maps that make it look the same size as like. Greenland, which is polar and tiny. Um, yeah. So by building these things, you're avoiding all of these misconceptions, and you can actually show how close in size mm -hmm. Charon and Pluto are. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and you can you can you can show the distances and things like that if you want to. Um, you can see all the all the details on here, so you can see you can see the whale shape. You can see uh, you can see the heart. It's a little harder to, to pull the heart out because it folds over. It's it's on a curve. Um, Tom, they're calling that Tom Reggio as of like an hour ago. <laughs> like, wow, so exciting. Um, so also, this is a pretty finicky project. It's not as finicky as those globes that my dad made that I showed you, but um, this definitely takes some dexterity. So I'm recommending it. I recommend it for older kids. I have one here. This was made by a younger kid, and then it, I brought it home, so it's definitely a little squashed. But um, this isn't like the youngest of young kids. I wouldn't recommend this at preschool. You need scissor skills and like stick your finger in and tape it or glue or whatever. So it's a little bit harder. Older kids, um, but it's also a more advanced concept, so that's great. Um, for the younger kids, I had another project going, uh, which is uh, ice painting. And and we learned today that these are water ice worlds. Hydra, uh, which is yeah. this little tiny football of a uh, or potato, I guess is better. It's a little tiny spot of. I kept wood. calling it Nix earlier. Hydra. Yeah, it's <laughs> Hydra is is amusingly given its name. Um, it's like water ice, all water. Need a drink? Go melt Hydra. Grab a chunk off of it. Bring it back into the inner solar system. You're yeah. good. All those Tons. science fiction books that talked about that. I mean, Kim Stanley Robinson totally predicted this with, with his fiction. It turns out this is water ice out in the outer solar system. And Yeah. The one that's blowing my mind is my understanding of that media conference was that they're they think that there are 11,000 foot tall ice mount water ice mountains on Pluto that are coated with a layer of like methane ice and, and other ices. That's yeah. like Mount Rainier is here. That's like all ice. Yeah. But, you know, they haven't proven that yet. You know, they're like, well, we haven't detected the water ice, but the model works. Well, and, and it's one of these things where, so here's the picture that we were looking at earlier today. Uh, this is Pluto high res image uh, nasa.gov slash image dash features slash the icy mountains of Pluto with a bunch of hyphens. We'll put in links for everything. Um, yeah. So, so this is 
spiky bits that are mountains that have icy plains around them and no craters to be seen. And this is an image that's taken at the edge of the white and dark on the heart-shaped region, uh, lower right part. Um, let me, so, so here is our full map of Pluto. Um, down at the bottom of the heart is where that zoom in was taken. This heart is now Tamba Regio, named after uh, Clyde Tamba, the discoverer. And when you zoom in, um, first big surprise is we were expecting craters. The fact that we're not seeing any craters indicates the surface is like 100 million years old, which which 100 million years ago on Earth, we had like life everywhere. I'm, I'm pretty sure that we were like out of dinosaurs and into cool life at that point. I need to confirm that. Um, and, and so this is a young surface and it's a young surface with just like you said, these are mountains the size of the Rocky Mountains. And to, to give you an idea of, of what exactly that means for scale, um, I'm trying to add in a new image to look at. So this right here, and I'll zoom in on this. This is a size comparison of Earth, Moon, Pluto, and Chiron with old images of Pluto and Chiron. So ignore the maps of Pluto and Chiron. Now, you know how big the Rockies are. Now imagine the Rockies stuck onto something that much tinier. And that, that's exactly what we're dealing with here in this image. Um, and then, yeah, water ice plains in between. And everyone's thinking this must mean that there's cryovolcanism or geysers like they have at Yellowstone on Pluto. We still don't have the definitive proof, but something's filling in those regions. And those ice particles, when they form, this is liquid that crystallizes out. And you were teaching kids all about crystallization yesterday. So yeah. let's, let's get it crystallization. Okay. So um, I, I was asking the prompt because we're doing this ice paint recipe. And I already put the link up there and I emailed it to Pamela. So it'll be in there. This is from, from PBS Kids. They're just doing it as a, a winter activity. But I was like, that's real geology. And it's fun. And I'm in a library, so I can't use real paint. So uh, this is going to be great. Um, so what I've got here is uh, it's Epsom salt mixed with water, 50-50. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, and then you just paint whatever you want. Um, and I have found that it's really good if you can make it thick. And then you want to cool it, okay? Because see, it's going to take a, uh, excuse me, dry it out. So you, this is going to take a little while. So I'm going to put it here. Um, I brought a hot plate. Let's see. I do this. Yes. Okay. So I brought this on a hot plate. I'll check in on it again. You need to be louder. Your mic went okay. away. <laughs> I probably covered my mic by turning that. Is that better? <laughs> yeah, much better. Okay, great. I probably covered my mic while I turned it. We'll check in on that again in a couple of minutes um, because it'll it'll dry out. But I can show you what it's going to look like. Um, so I was I was sciencing. So this says hot Epsom only E1. One is for only plus time is <laughs> is, is what that 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 means. Um, Always but label I, your work. Yeah. So my whole work is the label there. I think you can see the crystals pretty well there. Um, so this works best if you let it sit for a really long time. So this takes about two hours to dry. If you can just let it sit and dry, you're going to get nice, big, big crystals forming like that because crystals form over time. That crystal structure needs to be made over time. If, on the other hand, you're doing a bunch of kids all at once and you don't want them walking around with dripping wet pieces of paper, you warm them up on the hot plate and they crystallize as well. And you can see I get smaller. I still get the crystallization. It's still really cool, but it's much smaller, and I've got sort of a different texture going on. Uh, let's see if we can get there. And That's this nice is totally spot. a way to suck your little frozen loving prince or princess into science. Yes, I know nothing about frozen loving princesses. Nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> nobody, nobody I know loves frozen. Okay, uh, right. Sarcasm in the internet doesn't quite work. Well, I'm on video though. 
Um, so these crystals forming, this is exactly what happens when you're forming evaporative minerals like in dry lakes. This is what happens when you're forming Isis, like on Pluto, like on Sharon. And if it cools very, very quickly or, you know, pressure has a lot to do with exactly, you know, how crystals are forming and pressure on Pluto is very low. It's got the most minuscule atmosphere that we can really call an atmosphere, which we're going to learn more about on Friday. Um, but uh, here we're doing, we've just got standard temperature and pressure. Um, but ice forms the same way. So for instance, if you're thinking about ice cream, ice cream is creamy but it's frozen. The ice cream people do that by freezing it very, very fast. Or you can do it in a science lab by freezing it with liquid nitrogen. That freezes your ice cream super fast so your crystals don't really have time to grow into crystals. It's all crystallized, but they're tiny, lots of tiny crystals, so it's all creamy. If you freeze it slowly, for instance, let's just take some milk and cream. I'm allergic to milk, and you can't have milk. Like, why are we talking about ice cream? Let's take soy milk or something, and we're just going to, instead of, like, freezing that quickly or keeping on stirring to break up those crystals, we're just going to put the soy milk in the freezer. It's just going to turn into a block, okay? because it's frozen slowly. It took it a while to freeze, so it's just going to be one big messed up Sad soy milk crystal. It's not going to be ice cream, so you've got to keep stirring it. You also have to add the fats in and stuff, or you freeze it super fast. Both of those will make small crystals instead of big ones. Okay, let's check in. We can already start to see some crystals forming. That's so cool. This, this is something that I'm going to need to do with a time-lapse camera. Oh, yeah. And my prompt was, um, my prompt for this with kids, yeah, you want to do the long one with a time-lapse camera. Yeah. Oh, we should call up uh, Destin, Smarter Everyday Destin. He's got the super amazing cameras uh, that do all kinds of really fun things like this. Let's call him. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> and we can do it, too. We can all do it together. It'd be so awesome. Okay, sorry, I'm geeking out. Uh, Crystals forming. Your prompt to the kids. My prompt to the kids was, what do you think the surface of Pluto is going to look like? And I had them paint, and then it crystallized. And so, you know, that allowed it to be a little bit more. You know, I like to give a, a related prompt. So if you want to do, it's just a... Uh, and, and is there any particular reason that you used Epsom salt instead of table salt or kosher salt or any other kind of salt? Yeah, there is. Um, so you pour in hot water. My water's cooled because I heated it up before we started, you know, checking all of our tech stuff. So you just keep stirring it till it's all dissolved because you're making a super saturated solution. I will show you exactly why you use Epsom salt instead of... Um, uh, this is why you don't use table salt. Little tiny crystals. Yep, it just isn't. This is actually a mix of table salt and Epsom salt. I didn't do table salt all by itself, but it just, it really, you don't get the crystals with table salt. Epsom salt just makes these amazing glassy crystals. This feels smooth. It will, um, it'll crunch if you if you wanted to crunch it all off, you could crunch it all off, but it's and so much fun. I think Epsom and table salt, they have different amounts of, of impurities in them, which will relate to how they end up forming stuff. Yeah, and they're just, they're, they're totally different things. I mean, this is magnesium sulfate. So, I mean, I, I agree with you on the, on the impurities, because that's going to change their... Uh, like whether or not the crystals get interrupted by something, but they're going to be different crystals in the first place because magnesium sulfate is going to make a different shape and kind of crystal than NaCl. Yeah. There's just totally different. And I have to admit, the only thing I know about Epsom salts is you use them to soak hooves of sick horses, so I didn't realize they were a different composition. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really realize it either. I sort of I sort of knew, but then when I was trying this, I, it said, mix salt and water. So I got some table salt, and it wasn't working, and it said, oh, Epsom. So I dumped in some Epsom, and that's why I have this mix one. You can check my Twitter feed. I've got the photo of my layout, which ones are on the hot plate, which ones did I allow to cool, like to dry out with just time, which ones did I start with. 
I, I mean, I mixed them all with hot water and salt, so you get that super saturated solution. But which ones did I paint while that was still hot? Which ones did I paint while it was still cold? And I don't I, think anybody but me can follow the notation on all those pieces of paper. But, but what's <laughs> awesome is this really indicates a way that you can do exploratory science with your kids to try and figure out how do you best reproduce whatever awesomeness it is that you're wanting yeah. to create. And yeah. Oh, and my daughter helped me with all of it, and she's four. You know, she'd paint a little, and then she'd run away, and then she'd paint a little more and run away. Can I help you with your experiment? Of course. What am I going to do, Samuel? And, and you can imagine doing this with a whole age range with the older kids maybe carefully taking the notes and photo documenting everything with the smartphone. and Oh, you could do this at a college level so easy. Oh, like a real, actual, honest, hard lab. Probably not advanced college unless you're teaching a class on like teaching science or like stuff like that. But, but at an intro college level, in a intro geology, you know, even majors, geology majors at that early level, or, or not, like you could do this anywhere. And I was doing it with four-year-olds, so like, phew, it just depends on what you say and what details you go into. And tie it to Frozen, tie it to Pluto, tie it to both. Um, and mm -hmm. hey, the cool thing is you can also nowadays start tying things to Lord of the Rings because of the image we got back of Sharon, which which I'll I'll share next because this yeah. one, this is the one that that totally blew my mind because I just want to rotate this little world and I can't. So uh, this this is this is Sharon. This is Pluto's moon. And the thing about this image is, uh, well, first of all, we were expecting it to be much more uh, destroyed than it is. We were expecting many, many more craters. This means that just like Pluto, Chiron is also an active world and there is something going on that is resurfacing it. Um, and its surface seems to be pretty thin because that dark area up in the top um, let me see if I can, no, it's not going to let me draw a square around it. This dark area up in the top, um, they named that Mordor unofficially. And it is currently best guess of the moment by the science team is something hit the polar region of Sharon and plowed through a thin veneer of lighter material revealing darker material underneath. And that's kind of cool. Now the other like, amazingly cool thing in this image, uh, if I can get it to zoom in nicely, is over here on the part that's trying to escape is this super deep chasm that is order of somewhere between four and six miles or kilometers. I, I didn't catch it in real time I and it was all in real time. Three miles. So, so that would be, that'd be six ish yeah. kilometers. Okay. But yeah, it was real time, and I don't have my notes. <laughs> um, so we don't know if this is a straight line. We don't know if this is part of a circular feature. We don't know. I just want to rotate this world, and I can't. Um, but in addition to this, there's the amazing uh, deep canyons all along uh, Sharon mid-regions. And all of this completely unexpected, and we have no clue what the heck is driving uh, activity in these two little tiny tidally locked worlds that mm -hmm. don't really have a source of heat other than perhaps radioactive decay. That being so the thing that cool. I forgot on my uh, on my oral finals in college. <laughs> they were like, why is the earth warm on the inside? And I was like, leftover heat, you know, and they're like, and I was like, I'm never gonna forget it again radioactive decay. It's pretty major. And and when you're looking at worlds that are like water ice and methane, you don't expect them to have huge quantities of radioactive material that is capable of generating sufficient heat to generate cryovolcanism. And and so now comes Mike the question. Brown's been expecting it. He's been like saying he wants vol ice volcanoes. All the rest of us were kind of like, it's cold. <laughs> and 
and we're wrong. And that's what makes science cool. But now we're left trying to figure out how do you explain Tyler Locke to kids to explain why the science is cool? And how do you explain radioactive heating without like scariness? So, so have you had to deal yeah. with any of this yet? Yeah, uh, yet, no. Uh, in the past, I've had to explain Tidal Lock. Uh, kind of, that, that's definitely one that's come up before. And then radioactive, heating radioactive decay, and the dangers of radioactivity versus the not dangers of radioactivity. Um, and actually, that's one I haven't mastered yet. Because anytime you want to, you say the word nuclear or radioactive, like, people's heads just go off. They're, they're just... They just panic. And, yeah, so I, I have trouble with that one. Uh, so the, the best activity I've seen so far for explaining injecting energy into a system, and I think I'm going to rewrite this to explain radioactive decay, is if you go to a, a, a good film place that still deals with actual film, so like your camera store that's still dealing with the, with the diehards that, are going to keep using mm -hmm. film. Get film canisters. And once you have them, do not let your roommate, significant other, spouse, whomever, don't let anyone throw them away because film canisters are like the, the uh, awesomeness for all science demos. So get yourself some of these old film canisters and then get a bunch of dry ice and chop up the dry ice. Now you're going to end up with pieces of dry ice that are a variety of different, roughly the same, but a variety of different sizes. Put a piece into each little film canister, line them up like small soldiers, and they'll start popping as the dry ice becomes carbon dioxide, expands out inside the canisters. And this will happen over time because the different amounts of dry ice take different amounts of time to melt. And each time they go off, they inject energy into the system. And this is sort of like nuclear decay, where you're not quite sure when any given atom is going to decay. And when they decay, they inject energy into the system. Yes, I like that one, because I've, I've done that one with baking soda and vinegar, but I like the dry ice because it heats it up. So you're like adding that heat energy, so that's nice. You can buy film canisters online now just as canisters as a science or a, a teaching science supply. Um, they're probably more expensive than they used to be because you used to get them free. But, um, but you can actually just buy film canisters now if you need to do that activity, that those activities. So sad to not just be able to go, hi, can I relieve you of your excess film canisters? I am a science teacher. <laughs> yeah. A, a, a number of, you know, I think that's one of the ones I remember just sort of disappearing. But I feel like there's some other ones. Yeah, so so we have a lot of cool things. But but one of the other awesome things that came out of this is uh, all the silliness that has happened on Twitter. Because we were all just basically, how do we occupy the time until we know if the spacecraft is alive? And silliness occurred. What, what's your favorite moment of silliness that occurred? Uh, well, I definitely love the picture of Pluto hu hugging its little heart with its hands, saying, bye, bye, Earth, thanks for visiting. But I also, I, I really enjoyed uh, last night Stephen Colbert's late show video podcast thing that he's been doing once a week for a little while here. He had uh, Neil De Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson on, but before that, Colbert spent a little bit of time explaining the science of why this is really cool and about Pluto and about New Horizons and just how amazing this is. And he did an amazing job. I want him to go be a science educator. Join us and be a science educator because he was very, very right on. He was much more accurate than I expected him to be. He didn't play dumb. Uh, a lot of people who are not science experts in the first place will play dumb because they think that maybe it makes them closer to their audience. But he did the, no, I'm a geek and this is exciting kind of science education. And here's what it's like in your life. And it was, it was masterful. He does definitely swear because he's Stephen Colbert and this is, you know, promo for the Late Show stuff. So if that's going to be a problem, I would not recommend it for folks who will be offended by that. But he just, he just nails it. I mean, he talks about gravitational assist as drafting, which is, that's really, a, I've been struggling, what is it like? What's a gravitational assist? It is like drafting. It's different. It's gravity rather than atmosphere. But, but yeah, 
So I loved it. And and watching everyone squee has been fun. Oh, you yeah. had the band Sticks showing up at the advanced physics labs going, hey, we're Sticks. We're interested in the moon Sticks. And rock band from the 80s. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so so everyone's been into it. Yeah, and and there's been a whole lot of creativity coming out of this, and this is one of those things that, I mean, Stephen Col Colbert, he's he's a, a talking head on television, and he did oh. the Talking Head. I'm in love with this, but what's gotten me is seeing all the artists and everything coming up, and I'm gonna pull up your your favorite image as as a starting point. So here we have the the Pluto hug. Oh. And and so this this is someone just saying, "Hi, this is awesome. I'm going to be creative and create a thing of beauty and and love." Um, and and so this this was just one of of many. Um, there was over on on Twitter a GIF that um, it it's kind of sad yet awesome all at once and. Um, I'm going to let it go through a full cycle of the GIF. So, so you start off with just Pluto hanging out and look at that. I, I have a friend. My friend is awesome. My, my friend is, is leaving. What did, uh... oh. and it's, it's just awesome. And, and so you have all of these acts of creativity going on. And these are the types of things that you can inspire uh, your kids to do to keep them busy. Um, another one that, that you and I were both giggling over earlier was uh, Tree Lobster uh, from Mad Art Labs did a fabulous, um, well, Pluto, uh, and let me make this bigger for everyone. Um, here's Pluto on Pluto. And you can't unsee this, just like you can't <laughs> unsee the heart. So so go and explore the Pluto and the Pluto flyby hashtags. And, and how might you get your four-year-old daughter involved in something like this? Because she's the age we were when the Voyager mm. missions were doing cool things. Yeah, and I think that maybe part of what inspired ended up inspiring me to go into into Astro was just you know those glossy magazines from from back then on the they were on the coffee table, which was exactly my height at that age, you know. So it was just those were the pictures that were where I could reach them. Um, uh, she woke up yesterday morning and said to me, "Is it Pluto Day? Yay! 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 Yay!" And I'm not. I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Um, it's been on our calendar, and like I've been, I've been running all these experiments, and she's been painting them with me. Um, we've been looking at those pictures of Pluto, and then she said this morning, "Is it still Pluto Day? Can I see more pictures?" I was like, "Yeah, there's going to be more pictures today." I like asking the question, like, "What is this a picture of?" Or what's the, what's the most interesting part on here? Um, she needs to be a little more actively engaged and making shapes at that age, like if you just give them something and ask them to do sort of that uh, Rorschach test on it, they either pull out a word that's just in their head anyway, is what I've noticed, or they say, oh, I don't know, and they get disinterested and walk away. There's a little less Rorschachiness of it, unless they've drawn it themselves. That's my experience. Um, so I would probably, I ask her to do things like, here, would you draw a picture of Pluto? And then she'll, you know, she'll scribble. And I think that's engaging right there. That, I had that's... them draw pictures of them. Um, and we point out things that are similar to things that she's seen before. Just like, just like in science, they're like, well, we're thinking it might look like Triton because of these things. I'm thinking it might look a little like Europa because of these things, and we don't know what's going on over there. Um, so, uh, so we point things out that are like things on. There's dark spot like on the moon. There's dark spots on the moon. 
Um, and I've definitely had them, these, this age, they look through a telescope and I have them draw what they see in the telescope. Now their drawings are terrible. And in fact, they're, they're almost unidentifiably terrible. But so are the pictures they when you have, have to draw a dog. Right, exactly. And the fact that they go back and they look again, and they're thinking about it as they're making the marks, that's the brain connection that I want going there at that age. When you're older, even then, doing that, actually sketching while you're, while you're observing something, whether you're any good or not, still brings a different level of attention to it. So I recommend it at older ages, but at this younger age, they're not going to have anything that resembles what they're trying to draw, but they will see craters and they might draw, they're like, I'm drawing craters now. And they'll say that while they're drawing. That's very cool mind, mind to paper connection. I like it. That that that's cool. I I have to admit I'm not a uh, totally kid literate. Uh, only child, no kids. Uh, you end up uh, sometimes kid fail. Um, <laughs> But with the older kids and with college students and with rogue adults who are uh, in need of being kept busy, one of the cool things that happened, and, and this is a tradition out of the planetary science community, um, was haiku. And, and the tradition yeah. is at the Lunar and Planetary Sciences Conference, uh, people share out haikus describing their science results, describing their talks, their posters. Uh, so there's a whole lot of conference haiku that goes on. Well, these same awesome creative PhD having scientists, as well as members of the public, teenagers, everyone else was getting involved on the Pluto haiku theme yesterday. And this, we collected some of these and I'm gonna be storifying a bunch of this later. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share where you can find this and share some of the ones that, that we nabbed. Um, we're collecting a lot of this over on CosmoQuest's blog, uh, cosmoquest.org slash X. Um, and mm -hmm. this is our post, uh, Pluto Encounter B-Roll. Um, it starts out with Beatrice, biologist. She did a um, fabulous douche meme, such Pluto, very Chiron, so New Horizons, much NASA. Um, and we collected a bunch of this stuff, um, including, um, did you ever try to describe exploring worlds as Pluto haiku? Uh, so we collected some of, of the Pluto haikus. And what got me flipping through this was being able to watch the ever awesome Alex Parker, at Alex underscore Parker. He's the uh, young scientist who is responsible for putting together a bunch of the images and became extraordinarily sleep deprived and adorable throughout all of this and how he was interacting. Um, as the mission progressed, he went from uh, several weeks ago having what winds are sweeping across these distant terrains, quiet and ancient, which is just like cool and poetic and what you'd expect from a haiku to Pluto, 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 to Pluto, 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 wow. Um, yeah, so so Alex, we love you. Um, but there's all sorts of stuff out there and people were really getting their pun on. So you have Ron uh, Th Thubadu, who was like dwarf planet Pluto. That Mickey Mouse decision seems goofy today. Um, there's so many awesome things out there. That's wonderful. <laughs> And, and just imagine challenging your classroom, challenging your scout troop, challenging that board group of kids in your living room um, to, to coming up with haikus to describe the different things that they're learning, they're doing, they're experiencing. Um, this is something that you can apply to any concept you're trying to teach. Um, treat it like a scavenger hunt. The more things you can incorporate in your haiku, you're kind of limited to 575, so it won't be that much. But uh, there's more complex forms of haiku that you could, it, ad, advanced students could use if you wanted that's, to. That's true, and I can if imagine. You needed more space. <laughs> <laughs> forcing them to write N lines of iambic pentameter or something. Um, yeah, so there, there was uh, all of that going on. Um, and and then uh, you just finally you start to get all of the science fiction um, things, and so it becomes who can come up with the best um, way to uh, 
break copyright law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, here, here are my two favorites of creative ways of discussing things. The skeptics came out and said, new post, breaking, Starbucks to build on Pluto, universe rejoices, uh, followed oh. by... Um, uh, this is bossy saying, uh, rendering of the new Starbucks on Pluto. And and I am a total Battlestar Galactica fan, and I appreciate the idea of this kind of Starbucks on Pluto. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, uh, you do need the detail is incredible post ripping off early Star Wars. Do not try and land the Millennium Falcon. Um, so, so we live in a pretty awesome universe where, or at least a pretty awesome continent where we have people getting visually punny to discuss the science. Um, or in this mm -hmm. case, the people occupied while we wait to discuss the science. Have, have you seen any particular great science memes that really caught your eye? About Pluto specifically? Or just in general. Like there's so many memes out there that are explaining science. There are. I can't pull up a favorite of mine, like off the top of my head. <laughs> I have to think about it a little bit more. Um, but but this is is really one of those ways that you can start with with our whole cell phone engaged can actually make eye contact uh, generations uh, and. I revert to being apparently a 14 year old girl with a phone on a regular basis. Um, this is a great way. Even to though you were never a 14 year old girl with a phone, because back then we didn't have phones. No, no, we, we simply phones, like we didn't have, you know. We ran like, the cables all the way around three walls to try and get out of hearing range of our parents while stretching the cable out until, yeah. That it, is uh, so exactly right. <laughs> Yeah, I used the, the, the rotary dial phone, yeah, yes, rotary, in the basement because it had a long cord and then the, like, it had a long, a long cord to the handset also so I could get like way over in the corner. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, um, these, these are things that we didn't have the chance to do and now we need to rethink how do we do science engagement with this generation that has grown up communicating with emojis that's another way you can explain this is have kids explain the entire encounter or explain an eclipse There's so many things where you start seeing on twitter the challenges of explain this via emoji uh explain this via yeah. meme um one I does not just... simply land on modor mordor <laughs> no I just had an idea. Well, uh, filters, filters are super big, in, like Instagram and like all of the selfies and stuff. You've got all these filters you can choose from, and I'm not really. I mean, I'm. I I just take the picture because I don't want to add some crazy like add some purple. I don't. I don't know what this filter thing is about. We um, we use manual filters. Yeah, like if I'm gonna go tweak it, I'll take it into Photoshop. It, you know, filters are what. Are, the science is done through filters. They're they're applied. The filters applied to the, in front of the lens, and then you take the picture instead of being applied after the fact. But I think that's a like a natural in for today's teenagers, who are using filters, like to talk about how how do we get a color picture? No, it's not a color camera. It's a black and white camera, and we put filters in front. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. And and mm -hmm. stacking images, they they've all started doing the layering things together to get different special effects and yeah. use apps on your phone. Um, there's there's so many different cool things out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I see. So Guida Bibra writes: Imagine young children like Alice's daughter exploring the Pluto flyby now and later getting older and understanding all the science and then remembering the flyby itself from when they were younger it goes for all space exploration missions, of course. And I mean, this is like you and I had yeah. with the yeah. Voyagers. I, I remember being forced to take naps for the earlier Voyager encounters um, because I was just too young. And uh, so there was the whole argument yeah. over wanting to see the planet, not wanting to have to take a nap. And I took the nap because I didn't have a choice. Yeah, no, yeah, we did that. <laughs> there was there was napping required yesterday. Um, not for us. We didn't get any naps. Yes, it's just going to be 
I mean, I can look back on those as well. I remember the first lunar eclipse that my dad took me out to see. He woke me up in the middle of the night, and he took he put my coat on over my pajamas. And this was, like, mind-blowing, right? Like, well, we don't do this unless we're going to the hospital, you know. And if you have an asthmatic kid, like, you end up going to the hospital in the middle of the night sometimes. And I was like, but I don't feel sick, what? And he took me out, and the moon was red. But the part I remember most the coat over my pajamas, riding on his shoulders at night, and then the moon being red is there, and it's core, but these other things added to it. Like you remember the nap. And, and one of the things that research is showing is, well, first of all, when you ask people to draw things, this is handwritten notes are actually much easier to recall what you're taking notes on. Well, hand-drawn images through the telescope, hand-drawn images of let's draw Pluto, let's draw Chiron, that's going to do more to put it into your brain. And if you ask people, if you ask kids, what did you learn? What do you remember? What did you see? Asking them to go over these experiences, that helps to imprint it deeper into memory. And, yeah. and so bringing the storytelling in to make it part of the kid's identity, science is part of my identity. This, this is something that parents have a very unique opportunity to do. Something I do with drawing for people who think that they're not artistic enough is I emphasize that it, it doesn't matter if it looks exactly right. What you have to do is try, but you also have to label it so it's a diagram because as a science teacher, it's not my job to teach art. It's my job to teach science. And by labeling a diagram, like even if your dark splotch isn't exactly the right shape, you've put it in kind of the right place and you label it. This is, I don't remember even, the <laughs> Sharon's knee scrape. <laughs> what are they calling that? Um, a mortar. Um, how can I forget that? Like if you label it mortar. I like you label the fact it. that you just called it knee scrape. That is brilliant. That explains how it occurred. Right? <laughs> That's what I pictured when, when they're describing how it's just this layer off of it. I was like, wow, that was a wipeout on concrete. Ouch. Um, uh, that might have been a little too vivid. but No, but that's how a kid would understand it. Right? <laughs> so I just, and I think by labeling the things that you've drawn, that gives you some play in exactly, you know, is your accuracy. Especially for people who are getting started with the idea of, wait, you want me to look through a telescope and then draw what I saw? That's impossible because I'm not good enough. Go, no, no, no. That, we're not starting at Rembrandt. We're not starting at the level of Tombaugh and the folks back, back in the day who did all of their visual observations drawn. I mean, he, he had cameras, but, um, but you know, he, I'm, I'm sure he did drawings as well. And then you go back further, Galileo, it's all hand-drawn. Look at Galileo's drawings of Jupiter and its moons. They, it, they've got points. Yeah. That's not accurate, but it's representational and it's labeled, and he's able to d discover and determine something by marketing, marking it that way, which means you got to try. So I'm, I'm going to bring up an awesome graphic done by the folks at XKCD. So this is uh, Randall Monroe. And, yes. um He's not a good artist with what he puts out there. He's a stick figure, clever human. And he went through and he did this awesome, just making stuff up, uh, representation of, of um, Pluto that really forces you to look deep at the image. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's no science to this, but it forces you to look in detail at all the features. And, and I would start... say that is science. By yeah. making you look closer, there's not science in his labeling, but there's science in what he's brought your attention to. That That's entirely true. And, and there's so much to learn in this that isn't Pluto geology, but like he has the full text of the Wikipedia article on pareidolia and then totally exemplifies pareidolia with like Mega Man and belt loops and 
And then just getting people to realize, hey, there's totally different colors, chocolate frosting, vanilla frosting. Uh, hey, there's cracks. We're going to say it's beginning to hatch. Um, and then once you've made fun of it, you're, you're exactly right. It forces you to start to go, well, what is this thing actually? And my, my favorite thing on this image is his JPEG plumes. Yes, uh, I, I, that's amazing. <laughs> So, so image artifacts are a problem. You must have gotten like countless. Well, what is the, that is an image artifact. Yeah. Like lens flare. It's not really there. So, so these, these are the types of things that get people thinking and, and with learning space and, and you're a big contributor on 365, which is another place that we do this 365 days of astronomy podcast. Um, yeah. tune in on iTunes or click over to CosmoQuest slash X slash 365 Days of Astronomy. Actually, if you just type 365 Days of Astronomy dot org, it will take you there. Much simpler, much faster. Yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes just getting people to think and be creative and realize that science isn't boring and stale and heck, there's multicolored women doing it. Um, in all axes of multicolored, um, mm -hmm. get people thinking and talking and doing and realizing science includes all of this. Yeah, I thought of a, a one more preschool idea is food. Get some apples or some oranges, and with your preschooler, try to make it look like like Pluto. And like carve out or, or Sharon or whatever. Like look at the picture and say, okay, well, so we need we need a a, a scrape out here or we need a dot in here you know like you, you just use a a chopstick even or you know a butter knife just to draw those patterns on there or you know you can do the sharp knife part carving out some of the other bits well with with a potato you can probably just use a plastic butter knife to yeah, scrape that's the, true. Sprint, the skin and totally replicate um add dirt where it needs to be darker a potato you can do that uh, yeah. scrape away the heart um, the only trick is potatoes unless you get one of the dark purple ones um, tend to be very asteroid shaped and not very world shapes um, mm -hmm. well, you know pick whatever I would definitely say pick a food that your kid likes and is excited about uh, my daughter just loves apples if I had apples and was like we're gonna cut apples into fun shapes you can also do it like uh, if you get some little cookie cutter, like little, you can get little. They're not cookie cutters. I uh, I get them from the the Japanese dollar store for making vegetable shapes. But you can cut an apple equatorially, and you get a nice big circle. And then you give them a little cookie cutter, and they can cut out circles in the right places themselves. Because that's not so. Sh I mean, they should be supervised with anything that can cut anything. But it's not so sharp that they're just gonna like actually cut themselves very quickly so and you can get into like solar system bento boxes oh yes a friend of mine made solar system pizzas with her son when he was about seven or so and they they decorated jupiter and they decorated all these different plants and she let him decide how what to put on to make them decorated correctly so so cosmoquest does have a pinterest account and i think i will go down the rabbit hole later today <laughs> um, and and start finding all of this solar system food We've already proven i am incapable of making planetary cake pops not within my ability oh. cake pops <laughs> i don't even want to try cake pops i'm i'm worried about those i've i've tried four times it's it's not pretty it's not pretty at all but uh, it sounds like there's some other awesome ideas waiting to be found. And we have like somehow filled up most of an hour at this point. You want to check in on how this yeah. was doing? Just so you can see how it dried out. I took it off the hot plate uh, about half an hour ago, actually. <laughs> That's <laughs> I just cool. to show you. But you can see it dried, it dried differently because it was on the hot plate. But... At least that way kids aren't taking dripping papers away. That is very cool. So so you do so much good science education. Where all can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm Alice's Astro Info. Search for it. That's me. I'm on Twitter. 
probably the most often. My blog is Alice's Astro Info. I'm on Facebook. Um, I also I don't write for my blog as much anymore. I'm writing for uh, I do the podcast for 365 Days of Astronomy, and I'm also writing for the West Seattle blog over here. Um, but if you look for me on Twitter or you go to my website, that'll always point you to me. That, that is awesome. And uh, I, I think you and I, we aren't on sugar highs. We're on science highs. And that may be a little <laughs> bit of a higher high. Um, oh, yeah. So, so I hope you're able to catch up on sleep and all of the things. I, I'm a bit terrified of the recycling pile that has grown up next to my desk over the past 48 hours. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it, we got through, the mission got through, and the science has yet to come. 16 more months of data. Um, oh, it's going to be an awesome psyched. ride. And I'm going to get all of the links that Alice and I talked about today. I'm going to gather them up. I'm going to release them first on Patreon to all of the people who are following us over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash learning space. Support this show. Uh, we are an entirely not-for-profit effort done through Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, um, in the state of Illinois where there is no budget. Um, literally, like our state has no budget right now, and they may not be playing state, paying state employees. So yeah, uh, that pun suddenly got far too serious. Um, but uh, yeah, help help us keep getting science out to the public. and. Um, Alice, as always, it's awesome, and thanks for all the ideas that you've given this child illiterate person to do next time I end up with a niece or nephew unexpectedly <laughs> in my company. So, yeah, thank you. Call me. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> thanks for having me. And uh, to all of you out there watching, thank you for joining us. And uh, our next episode is going to be the last week of July, and. Uh, it's going to be our 100th episode, and so come join me, join Georgia Bracey, and we will bring you all the awesome science education. Have a great day, everyone. Good morning, good night, good evening, wherever you may be, anywhere in the world. Thank you.